Hello guys, this is Ayush. In this video, we are going to discuss the problems from Code Forces round 798. So this is the first question. The first question says that we will be given two strings A and B and their lengths N and M. From these two strings, we are supposed to make a new string and return that as the answer. Uh, the way to make this string is there are two types of operation. One is uh, take any character from the string A and add it to C and second one is take uh, from the next string that is the string B and add it to C and uh, we want to we will try to make the alphabetically smallest string possible and we have to stop once either of the string is exhausted also there is one more extra condition that uh, we cannot perform uh, same type of operations for more than k times in a row right so let's see how we are going to approach this question so uh, let's just forget about the condition which says that we have to uh, we cannot make more than k operations of the same same type in uh, a row so if that was not the case how we could have done is uh, suppose there uh, i have a string uh, something like this right I have these two strings and suppose I want I wanted to make uh, the alphabetically smallest string from these and the k constraint is not here so what I could have done is I would have uh, first of all sorted this both of these and right now since both of them are sorted uh, we can go ahead with placing pointers on the first element of both now uh, we can check uh, which of these is smaller so in this case since a is smaller we can push a into the r answer and we can move uh, the string like the pointer from a to b now from uh, the origin the pointer for the second element was at c and the pointer from first uh, string was at a but now it's at b so now again we compare b and c and since b is smaller we put b and we move this pointer to e now again so this time c is smaller so we uh, push in c and move this pointer and as you can see i can go on till the end uh, till any one of the string uh, is exhausted and whatever i get at that point in c will be my answer so this would have been an easy question uh, but there is one twist here like in this question that we have the value k so even for k uh, it's not very difficult so what we can do is uh, we can try to maintain a variable for the streak so uh, to check if continuously same type of operations have been made so we can have uh, that in the form of a counter right and we can keep uh, uh, increasing the value of the counter if the same type of operation is being repeated and once we see that okay same kind of op like the maximum limit has been reached k has been reached then what we can do is we'll print the other uh, we'll make an operation to break the streak and again we can continue our uh, uh, pointer method in which we search for the alphabetically smaller string so let's see how that is implemented uh, in the code so this is the code so first of all we take the numbers that is lengths of the string and k then we take the strings s and t and then we sort them in alphabetical order after that sp and tp are s pointer and t pointers so both of them are set to zero initially string answer is the, ans the string that we want to print at the end and uh, counter as i said is the count of the streak that we are going to maintain and uh, this int pref that is previous uh, is uh, is to check if the last uh, pushed character was from string uh, one or string two that is it was from string s or t so if it was from s i put prev as zero and if it was from uh, the string t then i put prev as one and now the main thing is the while loop so this while loop runs until sp is less than n and tp is less than m which means it runs until uh, uh, any one of the string gets exhausted so in this we have uh, a conditional which is one if else in that if else the first part will be executed the if part will be executed if uh, the pointer at the first string is less than pointer at the second string and uh, same for and the opposite for the else condition both the uh, 
both the fls if and else are similar and just complementary so we'll just understand how this part of the code works so first of all we'll check if the counter has reached k so if counter has already re already reached k and the previous is equal to zero which means the last added uh, character was also from s it would mean that now we cannot add any character from s even though uh, the pointer at the string s is smaller than the pointer at string t so we can we'll uh, we have no other option than to push back uh, the pointer uh, from t and then increase the pointer uh, then we'll also have to update the pref to one because now we have pushed back a character from t and the counter to one because now the streak is one and then continue that means we go again to the start of the while loop if the if the streak has not reached its maximum limit that is uh, it has not reached k yet then we can simply uh, keep pushing uh, the s because s uh, the pointer at s because that was smaller and update the pointer by one because we shifted towards right and if previous was zero then we can increase the streak if previous was not zero then the streak is one because we used it once and in the end we have to update the previous to zero right uh, so this is how it works for uh say s s p less than t t p similarly just like uh, using the complementary variables we can uh, have the else condition and once this while loop is break broken which means that uh, uh, either of the string has got exhausted then we can print our answer so coming to the next question in this question we'll be given a permutation of numbers from 1 to n and we want to make a dearrangement which is uh, one of the permutations in which uh, none of the elements go back to their original places so we want to make a dearrangement and we want to make it in such a way that it's lexicographically smallest so let's see how we can approach this problem and also it has been given that if it is not possible then we have to output minus one so first of all let's check uh, in what case it would not be possible so i'm thinking that in the case if there is only one element certainly no permutations are possible so no dearrangements are also possible uh, and for any case with uh, greater than equal to two elements you can always uh, do a swap and to prove this we can also use the formula for dearrangement which goes uh, like n factorial into 1 by 0 factorial minus 1 by 1 factorial plus 1 by 2 factorial and so on till 1 by n factorial so in this formula as you can see this uh, would give us 0 only for n is equal to 1 and for all other numbers it will give us a positive result which means that a dearrangement exists so now we have figured out that uh, if n is equal to 1 we can simply uh, return minus 1 now what about the cases where uh, n is not equal to 1 so let's take an example so let's say 2 3 4 5 1 so uh, let's say for this place like the first place there is a 2 here and i want i don't want the 2 to stay here because it's a dearrangement so i'll necessarily have to replace it with uh, any other number but uh, out of these four uh, what do you think should be the best number to be replaced so since we want the smallest number to be our dearrangement i think the best choice would be one so i'll swap this uh, two with one and uh, sorry uh, should have been one three four five two so now this uh, number has been sorted so this part is okay but these are still in their original places so uh, what i would like to do is repeat the same kind of operation again so i don't want three to be here just a minute yeah i don't want three to be here i would uh, so i would have to swap it with any of the numbers from these three so i think the best choice for uh, swapping should be two because it's the smallest so i can go like one two uh, four five and three and after that uh, let's say uh, for this part uh, i would like to swap these two so one two three uh, five four 
and for the last part again we swap these two so in this way we get the answer in this case it's one two three four five now let's try for another test case as well so let's say the test case is one two three four five so again for we want to swap one so out of these what is the best choice i think it's the minimum one so we go for two one three four five then again for this part of the thing this is the first element we want to swap it so what's the minimum here three is the minimum so you can go with th two three one four five and after this i think it would be two three four one five and then two three four five one so our final dearrangement is coming out to be two three four five one and certainly it's a dearrangement but uh, I think it's not the smallest one possible. So let's see. Uh, so suppose I say two one uh, four five three. So this is also a dearrangement, and it is smaller than the one which we obtained. So certainly we are going wrong somewhere. So let's see what is exactly going wrong. So let's come back to this step where uh, we compared one with all these things. So we, we wanted to swap one with uh, either of three, four or five. And we thought that three should be the best because it's the smallest one. But if you realize we don't really need to swap one, we needed to swap one when it was here because at this point uh, one was at its original place but here one is not at its original place which means it is already dearranged so we need not necessarily swap it with any of the other things we can leave it at its place so keeping that my idea in mind uh, i think we should maintain uh, another array in which uh, we can keep a track of uh, if the element has been swapped or not so if we had the track of if uh, the element one has been swapped before then we could have simply avoided uh, swapping it with any of uh, three four or five so now let's see how that works out to be in the code so here is the code for it so we take n as input uh, then we take the permutation as the input uh, as an array and then we maintained a uh, boolean uh, array to keep track if the element has been swapped before so initially uh, none of the elements have been swapped so we keep uh, each of swapped i as false and after that if n is equal to 1 as we discussed uh, we can simply uh, print minus 1 and return after that uh, p p is the pointer and we start at 0 and we want it to go till the second last element and uh, again so this uh, end is the index of the minimum element from uh, uh, like let me show you so end is will be the index of the l el minimum element in the remaining part of the array except the one which we are the pointer is at right now and uh, then we'll also have an overall index which means the minimum overall like including the index which has the pointer now we have an if condition which says that if the if the number which is at the pointer has been swapped already and overall a minimum is not equal to the minimum then what we can do is uh, we can just move on so it it is the case uh, in which say suppose this is one this is uh, uh, this uh, for this the value in our array would have been true that is it has been swapped and also uh, the overall minimum that is one is also the is not equal to the minimum of three four five which means that uh, we it should be better off if we don't swap it so uh, we do pointer plus plus and we continue the loop and if uh, the swapped p part is not true then we can simply go to uh, swapping p and the uh, minimum index of the rest of the array and turn uh, the like swapped of p and swapped of index to true and move the pointer to the next place now there is also one small if condition here so the if condition says that uh, if uh, 
suppose say uh, the pointer is at the second last element and at that point it is better of no not swapping but still we would want to swap because the last element wouldn't have anything to swap itself with so what i'm saying is if suppose uh, the pointer is somewhere here okay and uh, in this case you can see that uh, uh, four is better of not swapping because in that case it will it will uh, be a smaller sequence but then the thing is if we don't swap five with anyone then it would have to remain at its place and that wouldn't be a valid derangement so to just check off that thing we have put a if condition to check if it's the second last element and the last element hasn't been swapped yet then we'll uh, definitely have to swap it and once we have swapped the last element then there's nothing left in the loop so we can simply break off it and in the end we just print out uh, uh, our derangement hello guys i'm aditya c and now let's look at the solution to problem c infected key misha has found a binary tree with n vertices numbered from 1 to n so binary tree is a tree such that every node in the tree has at most two children now unfortunately the root of the tree got infected the following process happens in time misha can choose a non-infected not deleted vertex and delete it along with all edges that are connected to this vertex or she can just do nothing and then the infection spreads to each vertex that is connected by an edge to an already infected vertex. All infected vertex remain infected. As Misha does not have much time to think, please tell him what is the maximum of vertices he can save from the infection. Deleted vertices not counted as saved. Let's say we have the loop and to the loop let's say we have two nodes attached. And these two nodes would have their own corresponding subtree. So the subtree of a node would be all the relations of the node starting with that. So this its children, its grandchildren and so on. And similarly, we'll have a subtree over here. Now, let's say this node gets infected. If this gets infected, I have two choices. I can either delete this node, which I'll denote with black, or delete this node. So if I delete, say, this node, the number of nodes that get saved in the subtree would be the number of nodes in the subtree. So I'll just call it maybe S of I. Let's say this node is node i. So the number of nodes I'll save here is s of i, which is the number of nodes in this subtree. Uh, let's say I'm defining s of i that way, minus 1. So I can save all nodes in the subtree apart from the node that I'm deleting. Right? So I would save s of i minus 1 nodes here. And because I saved this in the next step, this node will get infected because these two are neighbors. Now, if this gets infected, I have to again, you know, do the same process like this may have one children or two children and based on that I have to see what I can do. So you can note that there are two things that you encounter here. So one is S, S of i which is the total number of nodes in the subtree rooted at i and the another one uh, I'll call it inf of i. So inf of i is the number of nodes I can save in the subtree rooted at i. So let's say this is j. Inf of j is the number of nodes I can save in this subtree given j will get infected. So if j will get infected like maybe I'll have to you know, delete one of its children and based on that infection will spread to other guys and so on. So if I infect j some nodes in this will die and some nodes in this will remain alive after the process as well. So the number of nodes that remain alive will be denoted by inf of j and let's say, say sav of j denotes the total number of nodes in the subtree rooted at j. So basically s of i and sav of i will be the same. Now let us try to formalize what we discussed now. Let's say we uh, know inf of i, sav of i, inf of j, sav of j for you know both the children. It's a binary tree so at most you have two children for the root node. So let's say we know sav and inf values for both i and j. In that case we have two cases now. Like if this node gets infected, it's a root node, so it will get infected. So I can either delete uh, node i, in which case I will save sav of i minus 1 nodes in the left subtree. And in this, the number of nodes I will save will be inf of i. So inf of j, right? So first I will delete this node. All nodes except this node in the subtree get saved. And node j gets infected. So inf of j by definition will be the number of nodes that I can save in the jth subtree 
if the node j itself get infected. So the sum of these two will be the number of nodes I save if I delete vertex i. Similarly, if I choose to delete vertex j instead of vertex i, then I will save sav of j minus 1 plus info pi. Sorry for that. Info pi. So this would be the number of nodes I save if I decide to delete the jth vertex and this will be the number of nodes I save if I delete vertex i. Now I have to choose the maximum among these two. So I will just rewrite these two in a different way. So inf of j we have sav of i minus 1 plus inf of j. I will just add and subtract sav of j. Right? And I will do this for both. So you also uh, pretend that I added and subtracted sav of i. So you will have sav of i plus sav of j plus inf minus sav minus 1. Right? So I will just write as si plus sj and the other one will be inf. So let's write as i inf minus sav minus 1. And similarly, the other one would be si plus sj plus inf i minus sav i minus 1. I am just doing this for mathematical ease. So basically, these two terms repeat. So I can just keep both together. So it will be sav of i plus sav of j plus max of this value taken for i and j. Right? So say I have a root with two children and I am able to compute sav and inf values for both the nodes. Then in that case, inf of the root basically that is the number of nodes I can say if the root gets infected that will be equal to maximum of these two values and what would be sav of the root sav of the root would basically be when the root does not get infected at all that will just be s of i plus s of j plus 1 right number of nodes here plus number of nodes here plus 1. So with that we now have a way to calculate sav and inf for the root if I know sav and inf for the children. I consider only one case like the case where the root has two children. So it is possible that the node I am at has only one child. So let us look at that case. So if I have only one child and I have only one subtree, uh, if this gets infected, my best bet is to delete this node. So I can save sav of, let us say call this node k. I can save sav of k minus 1 nodes if this gets infected. And if this is not infected, I can save all nodes here. So I can save sav of k nodes. And I can save this node as well, so sav of k plus 1. So if this gets infected, I can save sav of k minus 1 nodes. If this does not get infected, I can save sav of k plus 1 nodes. And similarly, the third case when it has no children. If it has no children, if it gets infected, I save 0 nodes. If it does not get infected, I save this node, so I save 1 node. So sav will be equal to 1 and inf will be equal to 0. Right? So these are the three cases that we will have. If the root we are at has 2 children, if it has one child, if it has zero children. If it has uh, two children, we just can take the max of these two values. And how would we compute i of j and i of i? That we would do by you know uh, treating taking this subtree and calling uh, whatever function we have written for this itself. So given the values computed for the children, we were able to you know compute it for the parent. And this way we were able to compute it for all three cases: the two children case one child case and zero child case. So now, uh, how do we compute uh, i of j and i of i? For that again, we take this subtree and we treat this as a parent node and we compute uh, in for both its children and based on that we compute i. So basically we have the root. So at the root we will say, hey, go compute inf and sav for its children and then do this computation. Right? So I have to compute inf and sav for this node. I will again say, okay, this is like a subtree now I have. Compute inf and sav for these children and based on that compute no uh, inf and sav for this guy. So basically I will start at the top node and I will say compute for children and that will say compute for grandchildren. Basically I will compute for the lowest level of nodes that I have and the lowest level node would be a leaf. And for the leaf, I already have inf and sav to be fixed values. So once I have computed the values for the children, once I have done for the bottom row, I can use that to compute for the next row, for basically for the next generation, the previous generation actually. And based on that for the previous generation, based on that for the previous generation. So at some point I will compute infant sav for these people, based on that I will compute infant sav for this guy. 
and based on that I'll compute inference of this. So something like a depth first search makes sense because first I'm saying at a node, go to its children, compute whatever I wanted to compute for its children and use those values to compute from this. So if we have a look at the code, so first uh, n is the number of nodes in the tree, I am getting that as input and I am you know storing the tree in the form of an adjacency list and I am setting sav and int for all nodes to be 0 and after that I am getting the edges and I am pushing the edges uh, as we require in the adjacency list and I have written a function void dfs uh, for vertex v and whose parent is v. I am setting sav of v to be 1, uh, I can save that node itself if it is not infected and I am setting in for v to be 0 because I can't save that node if it is infected. Now this is the base case, if uh, it is a leaf node, basically it has only one neighbor and it is not the root node, the root node has parent 0. So if it is a, uh, has only one neighbor and it is not the root node, it is a leaf node, so I just return there because sav and int have been set already. And then I set uh, saves to be 0, saves should basically be uh, this value s of i plus s of j, for a single child case it will just be s of child. I am setting uh, saves to be 0 and setting temp to be minus mod, mod is a uh, high value and basically mod would be to compute the maximum of this value and this value can be computed by saves. So let us say uh, the node has only one child and that would be captured by this if it is a root having one neighbor or if it is a non root having two neighbors. So in that case you know I know that there is only one child, so for the one child case we saw that int would be s of k min minus 1 and sav would be s of k plus 1 right. So I have already set sav to be 1, so I just need to add sav of the child and for inf I need to add sav of child minus 1. I can do this only after computing sav for the child and for that I am calling this function again dfs. So dfs is basically the function that computes sav for all the nodes in the subtree rooted at uh, v right. So in the subtree rooted v it computes infant sav first. So I am saying hey go and compute sav from sav and int from my child and based on that update sav and int for the vertex. Now we come to the case where the node I am at has two children. So if it has two children I am computing this value separately and I am computing max of this value separately. The si plus sj I am computing in the variable saves. So sav plus uh, saves plus equal to sav of c so, and then I am computing temp, temp would be max of temp comma this thing and then once I am done with that sav of v plus equal to saves. So I can save all the people that come under me basically all the subtrees that come under me if I do not get affected, if I do not get infected and else uh, if uh, right, if I am to get infected I can add saves so I can add this value, I add this value plus the max of this value over all and Temp. temp would calculate max automatically. So, yeah. So, based on my values for the children, I compute values for the current vertex. And finally, after doing this DFS procedures for the whole thing, I output inf of 1 that will basically be the number of nodes I can say if node number 1 gets infected. And that is the solution to problem C. If you guys have any doubts, feel free to put it in the comments and do like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.